And in doing so, because Christians have lost their desire to uphold the authority of God's Word, we have lost our ability to uphold the authority of God's Word. So many people use the Bible as a fact checker than they do the divine guidance over their life as God's revealed truth unto us. The Bible has become so <clears throat> understated, so under appreciated, so left by the wayside that people are relying on one another and, and we're all fallible people. We're all sinful people that have inherited the sin that is passed down from Adam's sin and we're relying on other people more so than we're relying on God's Word and God Himself. I've had many of you and, and many uh, throughout my ministry come to me asking for help. Preacher, I need help with this situation. Preacher, how can I get through this situation? Preacher, I'm, I don't know what to do. I can't help you with that. But God's Word can. And if you'll notice, when you ask for my counsel, and you ask for my instruction, and you ask for my advice, I always begin in God's Word. Because that is the authority, that is the direction, and that is the only absolute truth that we have in this temporary life that we're living. I, I've been challenged by some of my uh, friends, but uh, more so uh, fellow pastors, uh, by their new age thinking. And many people are surprised when they meet a young pastor and, and find that he's very traditional and very conservative as I am. And so I've got a lot of New Age thinking pastors that will ask me or make comments about my view of Scripture and say, why do you still believe that? Why are you still in the Stone Age in your understanding of the Bible? Why or haven't you gotten with the times? You need to get with the times of today. Why don't you understand that this scholar has explained the Scriptures in this way, and that is what they mean. The reason is because I believe what the Scriptures say. I don't believe what man says about the Scriptures. I believe what God has said within His Scriptures, and what God has revealed unto us. And so, so many people rely on scholars, and they rely on commentaries, and they rely on people to tell them what God has said. Let me tell you something, we're all stumbling along trying to figure out what God has said to us in His Word. It, it, it has to come from relying on the Holy Spirit dwelling within you to reveal to you what God is saying in His revealed Word. And so this morning we're going to talk about the authority of the Bible, the authority of the Scriptures. How do we make the Scriptures an authority in our world again? Before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You for this morning. Lord, we thank You for the Word that You have provided us. Lord, may we never take it for granted. And Lord, as we uh, look at Your passages this morning, may You just give me an understandable uh, speech and just speak through me, Father, as, as we look at the truths You have revealed to us and help us to understand them better. May Your Holy Spirit just convict and comfort and help provide the ability to see what you have provided. Lord, it's all these things that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to turn to Psalm 119. We're just going to be working through the whole chapter this morning. It's, it's only uh, 176 verses, so uh, we'll just work through that, and it should be a good morning. No, we're not working through the whole chapter. But uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful chapter of Scripture, and it's been given all of these titles as, as far as to make it interesting. It's uh, the center passage of the Bible, most times if you open up the center of your Bible, you're going to be somewhere in Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter in the Bible, and so people give it that title. But the reason why we're in Psalm 119 this morning is because there isn't a better passage in the Bible that better explains the sufficiency of Scripture. The fact that the Bible is enough. God's Word is enough for us. So in Psalm 119, we're going to be looking at verses 137 to 144. And this comes in a section, it's, it's about uh, 
But this is the 18th section. There's, there's a lot of sections that come, and it's in five to ten verse uh, spaces here. This one is entitled Solomon. And so beginning in verse 137, Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. You have appointed your testimonies in righteousness and in all faithfulness. My zeal consumes me because my foes forget your words. Your promise is well tried, and your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is righteous forever, and your law is true. Trouble and anguish have found me out, but your commandments are my delight. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. So we go back to verse 137 where it says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. Now when we hear the word rules, we kind of grimace a little bit. Why are we being given all of these rules to have to follow when we know that if we believe in Jesus, we're going to be eternally saved? Well, the reason why we are given these rules is to understand the righteousness of the Lord our God. When God gave us His law and when He gave us His word as a whole, He has incorporated commandments or rules within all of it. And the reason why is to display His righteousness unto us. To help us understand what He, what he wants, what He is asking, what He is requesting His people to live, how to live, what to follow, what to believe, how to act, what have you. That's why He has revealed His righteousness in his right or just rules. And so the Lord's righteousness is revealed in His Word. Verse 138, You have appointed your testimonies in righteousness and in all faithfulness. Along with the commandments of God are also found the testimonies of His Word. And they are faithful and righteous as well. One of the greatest testimonies of God found in the Scriptures is in 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. And this testimony says, And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. One of the greatest testimonies of God through His Scriptures and to us today is Jesus Christ, His one and only Son, in whom we have eternal life if we have placed our faith in Him. We go back to Psalm 119, verse 139. My zeal consumes me because my foes forget your words. What is zeal? Zeal is another word for earnestness. I am earnest in following your word, as the psalmist is saying here. And then he says the foes, uh, these foes forget your words. The enemies of the one that is writing this psalm, we don't know who it is, could be David, but uh, never mentions who wrote Psalm 119. But whoever it is, they have enemies because they are following God's Word. And so their enemies, being the psalmist, is also God's enemies because they are not following, they are not believing in, they are not trusting in God's righteous rules, His righteous and faithful testimonies. Verse 140, Your promise is well tried, and your servant loves it. All of Scripture incorporates and encompasses the promises of God, what God has promised, whether it was in a covenant with David, with Abraham, with Noah, with Moses, or whether it was the promises yet to come, that is eternal life, that is knowing that Jesus Christ is going to return for His faithful servants. And so we know that those promises are there. And I love this statement where it says, your promise is well tried. What does that mean? Uh, Psalm chapter 12 verse 6 talks about the Word of God being tried or being tested or being made pure. Psalm 12, 6, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. They stand, God's Word stands through any trial. They stand through any testing. They stand alone on their own and they are pure as refined silver has been purified seven times. And so we understand in verse 140 of Psalm 119, God's Word is inerrant. It is without error. It is without spot. It is without 
blemished. It is exactly what God intended for us to have in front of us today. Amen. Verse 141 in Psalm 119, I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. It doesn't matter what stature in life you are, whether you're small in physical stature, small in social stature, stature. maybe you just don't feel that you are that important in life. Well, regardless, if you are small and despised, it is not a avenue to be allowed to forget the precepts of God, what God has instructed us through His Scriptures. Verse 142, Your righteousness is righteous forever, and your law is true. Now in verse 137, it already told us that righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. So in verse 142, the psalmist carries that, and not only is your righteousness, the Lord's righteousness, righteous, but it is righteous eternally. God's, God and His Word are righteous eternally. They are eternally righteous. They will never fail, never be forgotten, and never lose their perfection. And then it says your law is true as well. And then verse 143, Trouble and anguish have found me out, but your commandments are my delight. Now all throughout Psalm 119, this a writer of the psalm will talk about different trying times that they've been through, different uh, difficult situations that uh, he or she has been through. And so this is just another one where he says, Trouble and anguish have found me out. Troubling times have come, but, the last part of verse 133, your commandments are my delight. Your commandments, God, are, are what is getting through me uh, these difficult times, these troubled times and anguishing times. And then the last verse here of this passage, your testimonies are righteous forever. Again, he's already mentioned the testimonies of the Lord being uh, righteous, but here he furthers and said the testimonies are righteous forever. They are eternally righteous, these testimonies. And then he, he ends this section with, give me understanding that I may live. Give me understanding that I may live. The Lord wants to understand what God's, the, the psalmist wants to understand what God's Word says so that he may live. If we don't understand what God's Word says, we will not have eternal life in the kingdom of God. We will perish in, uh, I don't want to say perish, we will live forever uh, in the eternity of hell. We must understand what God has promised, what God has commanded, what God has said in His holy and righteous Word. And so I could already say that the Scriptures have been defended with this passage in that they are the authority and that they are the necessity over our life because they are righteous, they are eternal, and they encompass everything about God. I could say that we were done, but I have more minutes, so uh, we won't be done. And uh, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 11. Excuse me, Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. This is how the letter to the Hebrews begins uh, as the writer gives it. And it's a beautiful passage. But what I hope to understand in working from Psalm 119 to Hebrews 1, and then we're going to go to John 1, is that the authority of God rests in His Word. And what I mean by that is that it rests in His revealed Word and the Scriptures, and it, re it is residing in His Son, who is the Word as well, as I mentioned with the children's church. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom He also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sin, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent than theirs. How did God's Word come about? How do we know we can take it for what it says? How do we know that the Bible is enough? 
Well, first of all, how did God's Word come about? In verse 1, it says that long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. God spoke directly and indirectly to the writers of the Old Testament. When it talks about the fathers and by the prophets, that's what it's speaking of, the writers of the Old Testament. And so God directly and indirectly spoke to them, and many times you'll see the Lord said this to His people. The Lord has commanded this to His people. And so that's how the Old Testament came to be, is God spoke to the fathers and to the prophets. But, verse 2, in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. We are in the last days. The last days began ever since the Messiah came into this world, being Jesus Christ. That's when the last days began, when He came and dwelt among us. And during these last days, God has spoken to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's why we believe that no longer man is able to perform miracles as, as Peter and John were able to as they're recorded in the New Testament. This is why we believe that man is not given revelation specifically from God any longer, but that we have been given all that we need through God's Word. This is His revelation to us, especially through His Son, Jesus Christ, as Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 is telling us here. He has spoken, God has spoken to us by His Son. And so God revealed Himself to us through His, excuse you, through His Word and through His Son. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 is what I just read for the children. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and we know that the Word is Jesus Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. In John 1, 1 through 4, it tells us that a title for Christ is the Word was God, or the Word was with God. He is the Word of God. And so it's a very fitting title because He is the direct revelation of God to mankind, just as the Scriptures as a whole are the direct revelation of God to mankind. And so we can understand that. And then... Uh, we see that uh, back in Hebrews 1.3 that Jesus and the Father are one and that the radiance of God's glory, He is the exact imprint of His nature, the sustainer of the universe because of God's power. So we, we've looked at these three main passages, Psalm 119, Hebrews 1, and John 1. When we look at them all together, what does it tell us? What do we uh, see as God has revealed it to us? What it tells us is that God's authority resides in His Word. His spoken Word in the Bible and His revealed Word in His own Son, the person, Jesus Christ. Both being righteous, both being eternal, and both providing life. If it were not for the Bible, then we wouldn't know how to become a follower and servant of Jesus Christ, thus having eternal life. And if it weren't for Jesus, then we would not have a Savior to place our faith in so that we would have the eternal life that the Bible has instructed us and promised us we will receive. I'm sick and tired of, of this one statement. and it's, it's a bunch of statements, but so many people this day and time are trying to say, this is what God meant to say. God didn't know that society was going to change like it has today. You have to understand, in the context of this passage, to, to understand this truth that I am trying to tell you. You still believe that? There have been so many scholars show you that that is outdated. Let me tell you something. If we start going away from God's Word, God is going to start going away from us. Amen. We have a duty to remain faithful to what God has directly given us and not trust in man's own 
opinion. So many times, and this happens not just with the scriptures, it happens, it's happening today with our constitution, it's happening with so many of the directions of life that we have been given. And so many people think that their opinions are not being included. So let's look at the passage in this way. Let's look at this document this way. Let's look at the context with this bias being the authority. So many people go into the scriptures. I got a book back home. It's called Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes. We can look at the scriptures in our own hemisphere, in America as a whole. We can look at the scriptures and interpret it differently than a third world country does in Africa. But the truth of God and His Word remain the same. And they are the authority. They are the foundations of life. And if we try to change them, then God is going to go the other way. Because we are not faithful followers of Him if we are trying to replace His Word with our own biases and our own opinions and our own emotions and feelings. I want to encourage you to go to Walmart this week. I know it's a mess, but uh, if you can find the, the aisle of books where the magazines and the uh, cookbooks and all are, they have religious books as well. A lot of them written by Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer, T.D. Jakes. And it, it saddens me, and I wish I could take a picture and show you, but if you go in there and look, I'm sure it's still the same. They've got seven shelves, I mean shelves, of books laced with man's opinion as to what God's Word says for you. You know where the Bible is? There was two on the bottom shelf, that much of dust sitting on top of them. Where's the New York Times bestseller? It's on the top. It's what people want to hear. It's what people want to feel. It's what people want to be encouraged by. They don't want to see that book at the bottom that tells them that God is full of wrath and that God condemns and that God is going to provide eternal damnation to those that do not believe in Him. They don't want to hear that. They want to see, how can I make my life better according to what these people have said? Now, it's not a bad thing to look at other people's interpretations of Scripture. I do that regularly. You know, I mentioned John MacArthur, John Piper, uh, Dr. Elmer Towns, we, we look at how they interpret the Scriptures. And there's nothing wrong with that, but when we go into that, we have to understand that the authority does not reside in what they say about the Scriptures. It's what the Scripture says about itself. That's right. mm -hmm. We have become so metaphorical in looking at the Bible as well. We, we've become looking at the Bible and saying, I think what he's trying to say is, God's Word, is meant to be taken literally. So many times people have lost that. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. This clearly shows that as we've looked at the Word of God being his scriptures, the Bible, as God's authority, as, as our authority for today. And then looking at Jesus Christ, having the authority of God, residing within Him, and understanding that has appeared to us. This, this Titus chapter 2, 11 through 15, really brings all that together. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Now understand that it is not for all people that have not believed. It is for all people that have believed, and so they receive salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. 
We are able to exhort. We are able to rebuke. We are able to tell people that we know absolute truth because we are delivering absolute truth that is the Scriptures because it contains, as it says there, verse 15, all authority. Hold fast to the authority of the Bible. Make it the foundation of of your life. When you make a decision, when you are faced with trying times, don't rely on one another to help you get through this situation. Yes, it's good to have support. Yes, it's good to have fellowship. But the main guidance of life is found in God's Word. Through the understanding of it, through the application of it, we have blessed hope in knowing that Jesus is going to return. We know that Jesus is going to provide eternal life to those that have believed in Him. And so God's authority resides in His Word, resides in His Son, and because of such, we ought to do all that we can while living in this temporary world to follow them. They are the only eternal things of this world. I want to close by reading Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And it's a great commission. I've, I've read it many times to conclude services. But we're on the thought this morning, the focus of authority. I want you to hear what Jesus said here in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, <laughs> baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.